go. Good morning, everyone. This is going to be a departure from the norm. The press secretary is not available today, so I have to stand in for, for the time being. Uh, we're going to start off, as you are well aware, with the Minister for Commerce. But before we just bring her on, it's always good to be reminded of some of the positives, some of the activities and initiatives spearheaded by the Ministry of Commerce. We have MSME Day, I think, coming up on Thursday. But before that, the Ministry of Commerce has a, or plays a very important role in keeping consumer goods, everyday items you and I buy, our communities buy, pay for, etc., under control, right? Specifically, specifically, I see Minister Eyebrows going up, specifically LPG cooking gas. Now, it's always good being reporters, journalists, etc., to sometimes take a step back and look at the broad picture. And if you notice, you may notice that LPG, cooking gas, has remained below $40 for the last financial year. And I think for the most of this financial year, all right? The Prime Minister always encourages press media to fact check. Fact check me. If it's, if it's not necessarily accurate, we'll come back and correct the record. But it must be noted that LPG cooking gas, going back nearly two financial years, has not exceeded $40. That means you go with $50 to buy a tank of gas, whether it's 20 or 22 pounds, you're going to get change. Why am I saying this? For this particular pass-through period, which started last week, the uh, 22 pound LPG before or without the subsidies would have cost $57 and some change. Right? So if you, if you have $50 and you go to buy 22 pounds, they're going to look at you, the cash register. Where's the rest? Because of these uh, subsidies uh, implemented by the Ministry of Commerce, this administration, that $50 you will extend to the cashier and the retailer. You're going to get some change back from that. Um, in summary, LPG's subsidies average between, or, uh, average between 30 and 35%. Retail prices. What does that mean? That means when you go to buy a tank of gas, whether it's 20 or 22 pounds, 30 to 35% of that is already paid for at the register. So, um, with that, without further ado, I think the minister who already elaborated it, brought some clarification to the subsidy debate at the last house sitting is here. She may wish to take some questions on that from you guys. But I know she will also want to uh, draw your attention to the upcoming MSME Day this week. So without further ado, the uh, minister will take some of your questions. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Now, I am looking at one of your members here in the, doing some crochet. I suspect she is a potential MSME beneficiary. <laughs> <laughs> no, she is. She has a skill, so that's how she managed that. And become a beneficiary and start a small business. So you are correct, it's, we are celebrating MSME. Uh, we have a day, but you know as a government we've been celebrating MSME for a little while now. Um, we've had our second calling, and God willing tomorrow at Parliament I'll make a statement in terms of numbers and what we have achieved. So I don't want to steal my fund this morning, only to remind all MSME beneficiaries to utilize the funds sort of purpose um, um, that you applied for, and also to remind others if a skill that we have a food, there's still a food call to come. So those of you who have missed the second calling to conceptualize your business um, prepare, come to the ministry so we can provide you with the relevant support to prepare your business plan. At the Ministry of Commerce, especially the CEDU unit, Small Business Development Unit, um, we have the technical staff to assist the small business community. Again, this is your government putting the people of St. Lucia first. The island St. Lucia can be Is the I Love St. Lucia campaign under your ministry? Yes, ma'am, it is. Can you tell us about this, please? Very good question. The I Love St. Lucia campaign is a campaign where 
as a government, as a ministry, we are bringing to the attention, we are trying to get all of St. Lucia to focus on purchasing and consuming local items as much as possible. In summary, that's what that program is all about. So when you enter the supermarket shelf, even before you enter, even before you enter, you need to make this commitment, and that is what we want. In our minds, at our homes, um, before we leave, you have to look at the items that we consume and see the items that we produce here in St. Lucia and make a deliberate decision to support local. So you consume what we grow, and that is in the agricultural sector. Um, we consume what we manufacture. When you look at your breakfast, the jams and jellies, um, the, the oats that we produce in Fonchejac, that type of thing. It's a conscious and deliberate effort. We are calling on all St. Lucians. We are calling on all procurement officers within the um, government departments when we have to purchase furniture, for example, that just don't, just make a decision that we have manufacturers that can give us and, and put together a proper desk that is elegant. When you have the rosaries way up in um, Miku somewhere there, they can produce all the desks that we need. When you're thinking, that is the hotel industry, when you're thinking of a mattress, that you have to think of Lubeco because they've got quality products. That is what the Love St. Lucia campaign is all about. When you think of a dress, start thinking of, don't just go on Sheen's website. Just start thinking properly. Oh, you see, you're all smiling because you're all guilty. Don't just go on the Sheen website, but just say, look, I want to have something that is made here. And we have persons, we have the Fashion Council, members of the Fashion Council that can actually put something together for you. And that, that, that dress you're going to have is a unique piece. Only you have it. That makes you very different and you wear it with pride. That is what the Love St. Lucia campaign is all about. Have I convinced you that you need to be a... You need to love St. Lucia as well in that regard? Very good. Madam Minister, in all love in St. Lucia, one of the biggest concerns is the cost. In love in St. Lucia, one of the biggest concerns, we always find that local stuff are costing more on the shelf and thing, and that is one of the biggest problems that we have as, as locals. And, and yeah. Well, that's correct. And there are different reasons. I'll explain to you why it will always be a little more costly than, because, than something important. Because if you think of when you produce something, the more products we produce, the volume, uh, the less costly is the individual piece, right? So when you look at what you're producing here, your volume is a lot less. The manufacturer is producing a lot less. But what I want you to focus on is the quality of what you receive, the uniqueness of what you receive. For example, if you had to buy the same product that you get in here by a St. Lucia manufacturer overseas, you might be paying a lot more for it overseas. Just put it from that context. And I also want you to remember that by buying local, you are supporting and creating employment in St. Lucia. So I don't want you to look at it from the a very narrow perspective. You need to know that when you go out and you purchase this jam or the packet of um, fried, the plantain chips, um, when you purchase that, you are supporting the employment of six or seven other St. Lucians. And not only that, you are eating a product that is fresh. The products that you are, you are the imported products, the, the shelf life is a lot longer. So there are several reasons why you should um, consume what is local under our Love St. Lucia campaign. Um, let me ask, is the, will the government be um, embarking on, let's say, incentive regimes to make people buy more local stuff? Where, with reference to what Jerry said, where you'd see if there are two products, one is made here and one is imported, 
the imported one will have, let's say, more taxes and so on to make it more expensive to encourage the notions to buy local, that sort of thing? That's a good question, but you need to know that the tax regime um, is impacted by different things. For example, St. Lucia is a signatory to various um, regional and international agreements. And for example, there are certain items within the um, CARICOM agreements that um, we have s agreed protocols in terms of what we can do, the level of taxes we can, and how we uh, impose taxes. So it is not something that we can immediately do. We have to do it within the regional context. Um, but there are certain items, for example, when you go out and you purchase um, one of the items that all of us eat more than anything else is the bread. The government already provides that subsidy for you. Okay, so anytime you purchase a loaf of bread here, it is a lot cheaper than the imported bread. But as I also said, um, it has a significant subsidy by the government of St. Lucia. Lisa, what happened to you there now? I couldn't even make you out a while. I need to come and congratulate you, you on the new look, Lisa. Oh, well, I'm happy that you're yeah, loving yeah, the yeah, new yeah, look. Yeah, it's a new look. Yes, Thank I you. need to congratulate you on that. Thank you very much. I'm just following your lead. You're following my lead? Absolutely. <laughs> following your lead. Hi. Sorry? What is? <laughs> Wherever she's shopping, so am I. <laughs> she looks good. I just wanted to broaden the conversation from where Jerry and, and uh, Tench left off. Mm. In, in broadening the tax incentives or just trying to get more people uh, involved in our business community, under the enterprise option for the CIP, mm. we do have that ability to invite uh, out or investors, more investors into our uh, business landscape. But we've not seen that leveraged very much. Can you explain to us what is the involvement of your ministry, your office, in discussing how we can begin to uh, explore and leverage the enterprise option under the CIP, because it does make provision for investors in an array of areas. My ministry sits, I have a representative on the board of Invest St. Lucia. And within Invest St. Lucia, when an investor comes here, the investor sits with personnel at Invest St. Lucia. So the link, more or less, is from that angle where the Ministry of Commerce is represented on the board of Invest St. Lucia, and then that, con that conversation takes place there. Um, in addition, we have the ministry, the minister, the CIP, the minister responsible for the CIP, who has, who's our deputy prime minister, who understands the needs of St. Lucia generally. And so when an investor comes, if he believes that he has to interact more precisely with the ministry, then he causes that to happen. So you do not at all uh, engage in dialogue? Upon, to invi see. upon invitation, for example, as I said, the investor would contact the CIP secretariat, the, the minister, and if there is need for a sit down with the Ministry and the Minister for Commerce, that is when it comes in. But don't you think we're selling ourselves short? Because your ministry, as you just indicated earlier, you are so actively seeking options. And one way for sure in being able to keep costs down in manufacturing locally or uh, creating anything locally would be to have investors who have the ability to bring in mechanization, uh, those um, who would be able to do a transfer of skills by being able to bring in new skill sets, train our people. Yeah, but Lisa, the issue of having an investor here who impacts the cost of production, the investor must first want to be in the manufacturing sector. That's what I'm saying. The investor must first make that decision. 
we present the various categories um, where the investor has a choice. After that, the investor has that, made that decision, then we get in. That's what I'm saying. You have a ministry that is out there selling the CIP. You have Invest in Lucia, for example. We went to, we being both Invest in Lucia, the CIP, we were in Dubai together. We made presentations, the minister, I made presentation to a host of investors. They make the decision in the end as to which area that they're interested in. And then we take it from there. So St. Lucia is not a desirable, what I'm hearing you saying is that St. Lucia is not a desirable I have not destination said so. I have for not, that type of investment. I have not said so, Lisa. I said the investor makes the decision as to which element that he or she prefers, and then we take it from there. Would you like to see more of, 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 of an interest from investors under the enterprise option of the CIP? Well, yes, because if any, so any, any investor, in the any upsurge of investment in St. Lucia is good for the people of St. Lucia. But you are not pursuing that at this moment. I am not the Minister for Investment, Lisa. We have a mechanism out there to market that to our investors. When our investors make that decision in terms of whether they want something, whether it is in infrastructure for solar, for example, whether it is for roads, then they go to Mr. Um, Senior Minister King. If they want something in finance, then they sit with the Prime Minister and the Minister for Finance. If they want something in commerce, then they sit with the Minister for Commerce. But we have one minister who has a responsibility for investments. Right. Your portfolio also includes business development. Am, am I wrong on that? Yes. Okay, just final question. In terms of the business development, what is the larger plan for, for that aspect of your portfolio? When you say what is the larger plan, what we have... Can we, you explain to us what that involves, business well, development? Business development, what we have is a unit that sits down. There we interact with the Ministry of Finance in terms of economic affairs, and we look at the wider plan for the country, and then we, have, we provide proposals, and we interact again. Again, the link is critical with Invest St. Lucia. Okay, so we have a structure in place. So you're that. pursuing synergies? We have synergies, and that's not, we're not pursuing, we have synergies. That is why we have somebody sitting on the board of Invest St. Lucia. But the decision is lying solely with the Deputy Prime Minister and the Minister for the I CIP. did not say that, Lisa. You indicated that earlier. No, I did not. I'm okay. saying the Minister, Deputy Prime Minister, has the responsibility for that portfolio. She, he goes out there, he markets it. When the investor makes a determination as to what he or she wants, then the various ministries kick in. But you've never approached him or the unit to say, can we see how, what more can we do to we attract? We have somebody on the board of Invest St. Lucia. And that person is at the level of the permanent secretary. Invest St. Lucia and then... It goes across to the CIP unit. Just trying to understand the synergy. Thank you, Madam Minister. I hope I give you some clarity on that. Thank you, Madam Minister. All right. Any more questions? Yeah, I'll In regards to the competition um, workshop that concluded recently, I yes. need to know what, like, what's the result. You know, we are training the public officials, so what are new policies that will be coming into play? Moving forward, how is that going on? Um, you are correct. We had a three-day competition policy training. We had support from the region, and we had support from the Commonwealth Secretariat. Um, what you're doing as well is, and all of that is to try to manage the inflation and reduce anti-competition activities in the country. Um, of concern to us, as I think I mentioned before, is the issue of monopoly in certain areas, especially in the area of food and in the area of household products. And what we are doing, um, at that session we had persons from the Ministry of Commerce, we had persons from uh, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, as well as from ECTEL. 
Um, we had this three-day training, and we will continue the conversation. The end result of what we want to see is a piece of legislation um, on anti-competition practices, as well as a mechanism um, to reduce anti-competition practices. So how far along are you all in the process? Well, we've just started the training. Then we have to go through, because it's, it's an issue that has regional implication. Um, we have to, we are going to see what policies that are already in place, draft legislation that's in place in, in Trinidad and Tobago in Jamaica, because they too facilitated the workshop. And then we have the Office of the Attorney General looking at it. And then we present um, a draft bill. Again, that will have, um, based on our practices in the past, we will open it to stakeholder conversation. So that persons have an, uh, a chance to comment on it. Yeah? yeah? Mm, okay. OK. Questions, questions, questions? That's good. That's good. Yeah? I think that's it. The has ended. Um, your, your MSME day? Anything? Yes, MSME day, as I, as I mentioned earlier, we are going to focus quite a bit on our small businesses. Um, but we want to move it from a day to uh, almost a month and a consciousness for our small businesses. Um, as you know, one of the challenges of our small businesses have is the whole issue of um, visibility. So we will really try to go out there, invite you to be there to see the quality of the products that is being produced here so that the average consumer would know about it. Um, we will have to be having some tastings at various areas so persons can taste the product to see that it is a product that is tasty and desirable and um, allow them to support it. The key thing is we need our small businesses to grow. As a government, we made a commitment, both for our young people and for small business, that we want to create millionaires of our local small businesses, and we are going to do all in our power to do that. Um, one of the things I want to comment a bit on as well, while I have the, the, the media here, the leader of the opposition um, accused the government of wastage. And I would like to maybe add my voice to the comments. Um, as one who has worked within the public service for a little while, a little while, um, and has sat at the audit office as head of the audit office for a little while, um, and as one who understands finance and accounting, and as a member of the community, a senior member of this community, I would like to comment on that simply because I would have hoped that as the leader of the opposition, um, just accusing the, gen the, the government, making a broad statement about the government's um, is wasting whether it was resources or funds, how we put it. You know, one of the things that we've learned as an auditor is that we need to ensure that when we make a statement that we can support it with evidence. Because if not, we are, it's just an accusation. Um, the leader of the opposition was the former prime minister. He was the former minister for finance. And to me, he ought not to have made a statement like that without providing the evidence to support it. And that's critical for us. Now, when you juxtapose, I always like to compare and contrast. That is one thing I always like to do. So you have the leader of the opposition, and it, the document has been presented as a document of the House of, of, in, in, in the Parliament, who went to England and stayed at a hotel where he paid over 2,000 British pounds a night. He didn't pay. 
Well, the government paid it, but, but booked a hotel that charged um, two, over 2,000 pounds for a night. Then you speak about wastage. Isn't that evidence of wastage and abuse? It's not because the funds didn't come from his pocket. It came from the funds. It's because it is... It come, well, taxpayers' money. It's, it's taxpayers' money. So I really wanted to comment on that. And I, I really want to, to... When you take another example, um, when you, based on the information that we have, again, evidence that the leader of the opposition um, entered into a contractual arrangement with a, a supplier to present um, vaccine for us during COVID, and that was EC seven million dollars, and that supplier was not one that was known to be. Um, involved in, the, in, in that sector, in the medical supply sector. And you went into an arrangement where you paid seven million EC dollars. Um, and then the information we have, this vaccine never got here. And up to now as a government, we are trying to recoup and get that money back from that supplier. I think supplier has purchased, has reimbursed about maybe f approximately 50% of that $7 million. So this gentleman then should not be speaking about wastage. And I still, and, and I'm saying so simply because when he, when he is standing speaking to you, the reporters, you only need to ask him for the examples. You only need to ask him for the examples. Because then, because you then relay whatever he said to the public. So you are standing between me and the public. You are standing between whoever you are interviewing and the public. So one of the things, when you had these broad statements without specific information, you need to ask him to give you that information. All right? So that's the teacher in me now, teaching you something new. All right. Any more questions for me? This weekend? Not in not in June, as as I know. As I I don't know. I have a committee. You have a carnival committee. I need to tell St. Lucians, as usual, they must expect the best from Sufred. You have jumped before. We are making sure we have a capable committee in place. I'm not directly involved in it. I know they just report to me that things are in full speed ahead so that you can have an enjoyable and safe carnival in Sufred. You know Sufred is always delivering the best quality. And we want to maintain that quality. Yeah, You're most welcome. Yeah. So thank you very much this morning. Um, before you ask any questions, I'll probably just say a few things about, um, you know, a couple matters relating to tourism and, of course, cricket. Um, I, I certainly want to start off by thanking all of St. Lucia um, and recognizing in particular the role played by the Minister of Sports in leading St. Lucia's preparation for the hosting of the ICC World T20 2024 uh, matches in St. Lucia. I think everybody who came to St. Lucia um, expressed their satisfaction with the level of preparation and what was on display. St. Lucia again was rated the, the best um, facility, outfield and pitch. Uh, we're very, very proud of that achievement. And you know, at the end of the day, 
you know, cricket and sports by extension is a vital part of our tourism component. So we are very grateful. There are many more matches to come. In August, we'll be hosting South Africa A for a couple of test matches in St. Lucia. In early September, we'll have CPL matches. And in November, we'll be hosting the English, the England cricket team for free T20 matches at the Darren Sami Cricket Ground. So for the rest of the year, there'll be quite a lot of cricket being hosted in St. Lucia. <clears throat> of course, we will release tomorrow the um, arrivals for May, and you will see another month where we broke the record for 2019. And we'll, it will like show that the numbers, the arrival numbers, far exceeding what we um, achieved last year. And certainly the best year we've had on record was 2019. And we continue to top 2019. So those figures will be released at the Tourism Advisory Committee meeting tomorrow. So those of you who usually attend will see the public announcement of those figures and the projections for the, year, for the rest of the year. We already seen very strong numbers for July for Carnival. In fact, it's almost impossible to get a hotel room now or a flight into St. Lucia, even though we added um, new flights just for that period. So we're expecting Carnival to be um, the biggest Carnival that we've had, you know, again top in 2019. So those of you who've been following Carnival, the Soka Monarch Finals is coming up, the um, Power and Groovy, and of course Calypso Finals coming up. Um, Junior Carnival next weekend and as well as Panorama. So we're moving into the final stretch of the carnival season. So there, there'll be enough excitement and a, a lot to talk about. And like everything else, you can't have carnival without having some bacchanal. So um, the Bamon wall will surface again. And the, you know a lot of those issues will confront us once again as a society. And I need to take this opportunity to appeal to all St. Lucians to be responsible in their behavior, in what they drink, and their conduct on the roads. And of course, to ensure that we do not have any acts of indiscipline or you know, violence or crime. Um, it's a time when people drink, it's a time when people have fun, and sometimes it can you know, spill over. So persons, be mindful of how you behave on the road, how you conduct yourself. Carnival is not an excuse for any licentious behavior, unacceptable behavior. It's not a, an opportunity for you to get as drunk as possible. It's not about that. It's about having clean fun. It's about celebrating life. It's about celebrating our culture, our identity, and who we are as a people. So uh, I want to say as we enter into um, the first major activity, which is the Carnival Queen pageant on Saturday, um, I think I'm in Tola, it's already sold out. So again, reflecting the strong demand for, you know, for the Queen show. So let's enjoy it and let's have some clean fun and let's celebrate life. Maybe Questions? Oh, no, no. Cicero, Cicero, Cicero was beyond belief. Um, our pageant on Saturday um, was really good. Um, again, the attendance was beyond what we had ever seen before. I think it was the best pageant we've had in terms of organization, production, and, you know, it, it really highlighted the importance of why we are doing the pageant in Cicero. It's really a, a social, you know, engagement as well, highlighting problems facing the community and the community's determination to combat some of the stigma and the negativity. And I think Saturday was a powerful statement. And I really want to thank the organizing committee, all the young ladies who took part, and the community itself. On the Sunday, we had our Cicero um, Carnival Parade, unique in its own way. A lot of vibe, a lot of excitement, a lot of, I was tempted to even join the crowd and, and enjoy myself. But, you know, it, it was really good. And I felt very good to see the community come out and support. And we're looking forward to next year already to make even more improvements next year. So that, that, that was fantastic. I'm still recovering from, from the weekend, but the sun, the sun was very hot, so it was quite dehydrated. It was incident-free, for sure. I mean, the community really came out and supported in a big way. So I'm really pleased, and I want to say thanks to everybody again for, for making it the success that it was. Um, would you endorse this statement by the Christian Council um, for, well, clean fun on the road? Yeah. Is that I, what you're doing? Well, I, I said so. I support the, the call, and I want to call on all St. Lucians um, to remember it's not an opportunity for one to behave in any way um, 
that is not consistent with clean fun. Let's enjoy ourselves. Let's have fun. One of the concerns about the costumes themselves, um, I guess the part of from the moment you dress up, I guess, in a particular way, it, it, it does lead to that kind of behavior. Um, what are your thoughts on probably having regulations for bands in terms of costume? I know this is uh, yeah. hard, I, I'm not sure I'm going to go down that road. I, I think people are grown-ups. There are laws in the country about decency and how one should dress and conduct oneself. Um, but we live in a mature society. And, and if somebody wants to put on a bikini and a bra, that's their, their business. Um, if somebody wants to have a full, fully clothed costume, that's their business. Um, so I, I'm not one who says you should have regulations, you must have cloth on you, and you must have a, you know, I, I'm not, I'm not going to be part of that. I, I think there should be all offerings, and individuals choose what they want to. But the overriding principle is that we must conduct ourselves in a responsible manner. Well, I, I'm not sure the, the, having a, the costume on you suggests you're irresponsible because of your costume. It's how you carry it and how you behave. You go on the beach with a bikini, but it's beach wear. Carnival wear is that, but how you conduct yourself, I think is more important. Okay, well, um, this morning, the um, Senator Philly, um called for the disclosure to, to be made on the balance on the escrow. Yeah, Senator Fede um, requested yeah. that you as minister, CIP minister, um, disclose the balance on the, the escrow account mm -hmm. and or not. Um, also, the opposition leader is threatening to take legal action um, mm -hmm. regarding the matter. What say you? Well, um, the balance of the escrow account, I, I'm not even sure, you know, what that's supposed to mean. I think the first thing the senator should do is issue the joint statement he had said in the Ranger Fair. Because when we were criticized, we, they were criticized for the Ranger Fair, he promised that Range and the government would have issued a joint statement on Range. And he never issued it. So maybe he should start off by issuing that joint statement. But also to issue the Range contract. See how many, re release it. Say exactly what happened in Range. Because in this government, our Prime Minister always tells us, we are the government of St. Lucia. We are the government of St. Lucia. And the reputation of St. Lucia matters. We cannot conduct our business in a way which will give so investors the belief that they cannot do the business with the government of St. Lucia. So if commercial agreements are signed, you don't just go and release commercial agreements publicly, because there are other commercial parts. That, there's a way in which people conduct business. Companies sign agreements. Government signs agreements. Government and companies sign agreements. And you do not just go and publicize commercial agreements. That's just not how you do business. And even when we've discovered the last government did quite a lot of things which are bewildering and shocking, we've never gone out and shamed companies. And even when we came to government, we sat with every single one to go over the issues we had, the concerns that we've had. We didn't go out there and destroy their reputation and the government of St. Lucia's reputation because we are mindful that the government of St. Lucia is continuous, regardless of which party is there. And you have a responsibility as a leader of a country and a leader who, pro who hopes one day to maybe become a leader of the country to safeguard the reputation of the institution of the government of St. Lucia. Because there's a lot, a lot, trust me, that we can do and see about the conduct of the last government that can even be embarrassing to the country. Do you do it just to score cheap political points? Now, they prepare to burn down the house to kill a rat. That, that, that's how they're behaving. So they don't care what they're saying. So they want us to release the balance on the escrow account. Did they ever tell St. Lucia how much was in the escrow account when they were there? Did they ever release it? Did you ever? You didn't even know the escrow account was in China. I announced that they changed the law to allow it to go to China. They changed the law. And they did not even put the law for it to be a joint escrow account. They did not. We had to ask to send monthly statements to us to know how much is in the escrow account. Up to today, we don't even know where the range escrow account was or the DSH one. Now, don't, I don't want them to push us 
where we go and we really start speaking about those things. We will not go and release any balance in any escrow account. If the other party says we should do it, something that can probably be considered, but I don't think that's how a country does business. And certainly not because if the senator asked for it. I mean, he, he promised a joint statement, it never came out. And there's a lot that can be said about, you know, Range, DSH, and some other companies in St. Lucia that they did business with. But if we do that, we'll be shaming those companies. People wanting to come to invest in St. Lucia will look at St. Lucia and say, I can't go and invest in this country. Because the moment one party says something, all they do is put out all our private business dealings in the public. Because businessmen come and they sit with you and they ask government for incentives, they ask government to endorse their project so they can go and raise financing. Do you put out all those things in public to score cheap political points? That's not how you run a country. That's not how you conduct mature political business, um, um, leadership. So we, we're not going to go down that road. Um, and like I said, we are holding back on saying a lot of things. I heard a lot of talk, and I had to say it in the address, about Chinese companies. Who brought the Chinese company to St. Lucia? Who brought Galaxy to St. Lucia? Who investigated Galaxy and gave them passing marks? The same individuals. Who took, who took all of them to China? The same Galaxy. And even let me start talking about those things. But the fact is, you were in government, you did it a particular way. We don't do it that way anymore. We believe we have to be responsible. We must conduct ourselves in a manner where companies will have confidence to come to St. Lucia to invest. We will never engage in company shaming to score cheap political points. To score cheap political points. So, you know, the senator can ask to, to, to release balance in escrow account. We're not going to do that. Um, he asked about the annual reports. Um, the, the annual report for last year is delayed. And there are a number of reasons for that, and I'm not sure we need to go into all the reasons why it's delayed, but I have been assured it will be available in the next couple of months, and it will be tabled in Parliament. And according to the law, the unit is supposed to send a report to me by June, and I'm supposed to table it by October. So 2024 is not yet due. It will be due in Parliament by October. Did it say so in your report? I don't even want to go into that. You see, uh, let me tell you, there's so much hypocrisy in all of this, but leave that alone. We have a responsibility to table it. Um, the last year's one is delayed, and it will be tabled. And of course, the one for, for um, 2024 um, will be tabled by October. Well, when you came in, um, uh with what you found um, with the escrow account being in China, as you said, and with the monies that were there, you had all, you said that you, um, the government well, told Galaxy that they need to build that hotel, right? Um, and, and I guess reports that you would have heard afterwards, um, did it not raise any red flags for you that you should probably, I guess, not have any more dealings with Caribbean Galaxy, or is it that Galaxy is above board in their dealings with you? As far as I know, as far as the unit knows, Galaxy has done nothing wrong in relation to the program. Our law is very clear. You apply, and let me go for the process with you, and I want you to listen to me carefully, and really follow it, and if anything, ask me questions. An individual wants to become a citizen, so he applies. He pays his administrative fee, he pays his due diligence fee. The unit will go through the application, make sure all the documents are in order. When they finish, they will send it out for due diligence to one of the firms. There are a list of approved firms. The due diligence firm will send back their report to St. Lucia. The agency will go through the report and read it and see whether, based on the due diligence report, you go forward with the file. If at that stage you fail due diligence, you reject it and you're told that your file is rejected because you failed due diligence. It then goes forward, it goes to law enforcement, and it goes to intelligence review through the RCC. If they come back and they said, I okay you, we will then say to the individual, you've passed due diligence, you've passed intelligence, you've passed law enforcement, can you now make your investment? Only at that point, the person then pays and make the investment. If it's bonds, they buy a bond. If it's donation, they make a donation to the National Economic Fund. And if it's real estate, they buy a share in the development. That money 
is the developer's money. It's not the government's financial money. Because they're buying a share in the development. In addition to buying the share, they pay a government fee. And that's what the government gets. When they have made that investment, whether donation, whether bonds, or whether it is buying a share, they will give us evidence that they've done so. It goes to the board. The board approves to give them citizenship. It comes to the minister. He signs the certificate of citizenship. So there's a process that can take up to nine months. So if you give somebody, somebody applies to the point where they get, it can be a minimum of nine months. It can be up to a year, depending on the person and how much due diligence has to be done. It's not something that happens automatic. And it goes through a rigorous process. So the law says you must make a minimum investment. Once you pass due diligence, you pay your fees, you make your minimum investment, then you qualify. And that's all we do as a unit. We the unit processes applications. So as once the escrow shows that John Doe has made the minimum investment by buying shares in the hotel, that's the evidence we need, because they've passed all the due diligence. That's the evidence. Once we look at the National Economic Fund, we realize John Doe has made his donation, he qualifies. Once he buys a bond, he qualifies. And that's the process. In your address, you, you said that you, on, on occasions, um, uh, you all did get reports of, um, well, marketers who were promoting well, the, the options below the, the set price. Um, when was the first time you heard or the CIP office received? I cannot tell you the exact date and time. I can, but I can tell you one thing, though. We do not condone underpricing. We do not support anybody's sales strategy that says, mm -hmm. one, they are getting a lower price, and two, how much visa-free access they have. We've sent out memos saying we do not support that. But let me explain something to you. It's something which I've said to individuals. Companies offer discounts in different business you know, offerings, whatnot. And as a country, our responsibility is to make sure that the laws of St. Lucia are followed. Make sure that the laws of St. Lucia are followed. The CIP has its procedures, the steps that must be followed. Make sure the laws are followed. And I'm going to come back, and I'm saying it again, because if, if it becomes necessary, I will point out to you where in the past the laws of St. Lucia were not followed. I don't want to go down that road. But we can speak of where... <laughs> Laws of St. Lucia were not followed. Our thing is to follow what the law says we have to follow. However, when people are advertising, we t we've said to them, and we will continue to say to everybody, anybody that advertises any sales strategy that speaks of discount, we will not do business with them. Or if they are downstream, anybody, who, promoter or marketing agency that does business with them, we will stop it. Nobody must advertise it, period. Did you, um, as you said, when you came into office, you saw that the, we, we saw the former administration had changed the laws in terms of where the escrow account is supposed to be held and with whom. Um, did you, when you come in, did you all have any considerations to change, the, change it back to where it originally was? Why, why but was we cannot it, change it on our own. Why was it not changed? We cannot, one, we cannot change it on our own. Because the, the law says they receive the money. Because they are selling a share in their hotel. It's not our share they're selling, a share in their hotel. So that's one. And secondly, there is a number of issues in terms of St. Lucian Bank's preparedness to host escrows in St. Lucia. So they, they, they had their, their issues about it. But we did ask them, we questioned them, why do you have an escrow in Hong Kong? Why, why, why is that the situation? And they explained to us basically why it was done. But remember, the change in law was not for Galaxy. It was done for DSH, by the way. Just two more. I think the, the, the Prime Minister has come. So there's two more questions. Right. OK. So one, who else? Yeah. All right. Please please. All right. Um, but you must let Lisa ask her question, because oh. huh? Lisa is there quiet. I haven't heard, I haven't, I'd, she has, I'd love to hear a question. Could, <laughs> could you? Um, explain the new infrastructure option okay, what are the provisions the yeah. pricing 
yeah. and how does it um, sit in relation to the existing options that are there? Yeah. Again, the, it, we explained that there are a number of options. You have bonds, yeah, where somebody can buy a, a, a bond. You have real estate where somebody buys a share in a development. You have donation where somebody donates to the National Economic Fund. And then we had what we call the enterprise. The enterprise allowed developers to build restaurants, schools, whatnot. We expanded what the, rest, what the enterprise could offer to include infrastructure, roads, bridges, community projects, whatnot. And it's a simple one. Let me give you an example. So a developer wants to invest in housing in St. Lucia. So the, in the, the developer says, look, I'm going to build a housing project in Canaries. For you, they give you this project proposal. It's going to cost 30 million US, 75 houses. The developer agrees to finance it from their resources or loan financing or whatever, upfront. And you agree to say to them, well, look, I'm going to give you, uh, say, 500 applications for citizenship. So everybody who applies for citizenship under that project qualifies for citizenship. But the developer goes upfront and spends the money and builds the project. And they recover the money, plus their profit, plus all the other expenses from the shares that you give them. So in the case of the real estate, the developer makes their money by selling their shares in the, in the, in the hotel or the whatever development it is. In the infrastructure, they make their money back from the shares you give them. That's how they make back their money. So they will spend their money up front. If the program collapses, they lose their money. If it takes two years to sell the shares, that's their problem. You know, whatever happens, they take the risk. They spend their money up front. And, and that happens in many other instances where, you, you know, you can get an investor who will build um, a, a project and recoup their money. But you know what, what's happening? And, then, and I want all of you to reflect on it. You know what's happening here in St. Lucia with all of this? The opposition is afraid that houses will be built all over St. Lucia, roads will be fixed all over St. Lucia, two years before elections. That's what this is about. This is political panic. The fear that St. Lucians will have a better life through the CIP. That's what it is all about. Think about it. If you're a leader of an opposition and you end the government announcing a new option and developers are all willing to be part of it, to build houses all over St. Lucia. Can you imagine we building 500 new houses in the next year? Is that the plan? Well, of course it's a plan to build as many houses as we can. A lot of St. Lucians need houses. A lot, a lot of young professionals, teachers, policemen, nurses want decent housing in St. Lucia. Journalists, Journalists too <laughs> want houses in St. Lucia. Is, is that the arrangement um, for the canaries and all costs? Yes, that's what it is. That's what it is. So can you think you lead of an opposition, you and a government will be building roads and fixing roads and bridges and community centers. What are you going to do? You're going to try and destroy it. Make sure it never succeeds. So you can understand the panic that is thing. And already an unpopular leader of the opposition. Can you imagine? It's panic. But you will destroy the country. Destroy the possibilities of St. Lucians having a better life because it diminishes your political opportunity. That's what this is about. And, and I, that's why I, I smile every day I wake up, because I can see what it is before me, that this is political panic taking place. When, when are the, these projects starting? Well, um, the housing projects before the DCA for approval, the roads are being finalized now in terms of internal costing, so the parties can sit down and uh, decide how they move forward. But very shortly it will happen, and solutions, I guarantee them, they will see that dramatic improvement in roads, housing, and other aspects. And then you will see the, uh, the opposition getting even more desperate. Let's take the final question from Choi. Yeah. Yeah. So you're not giving this uh, question? Are you moving? Yeah, all right, Choice. <laughs> well, yes, but the minister has already indicated. Rihanna, are you overriding? <laughs> 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 Go ahead, Joe. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm not too sure if you highlight that, but the CA, the CTHA, or CHD, the Caribbean Housing Movement, yeah. 
they released they released an AI guidebook for technology. I'm not sure if you touched on this, but you've been someone that's been vocal about AI use um, in the tourism industry and whatnot. So what are your thoughts on this guidebook being released? No, I mean, it was very useful and something we're looking forward to. And we've already started working on introducing AI in terms of our um, work in the, um, the St. Lucia Tourism Authority. And you'll be hearing more about it because AI is becoming a powerful tool. Um, because if you just figure out how it works, can you imagine anybody who goes online and they hit St. Lucia? We can capture everybody who does that. So can you imagine in one day we capture 15,000 people? And then we can use AI to narrow it down to about 5,000 in terms of persons who have a genuine interest, how long they stayed on the side, because some people can just flick and move on. And then AI will, and as we give AI more parameters, they can narrow it down, say to 500 people, most likely from the 15,000 who will come to St. Lucia, and then get our call centers and our different agents to go directly to the customer, because we know they have an interest, because they hit. And to be able to hit them and say to them, look, take them over the line to come to St. Lucia. So what AI really can help us with is narrowing down that mass of data and information to the more likely, so we can go more direct to potential visitors to St. Lucia. Before, the manual and some of the other systems were not as efficient and as fast. AI will allow us to see through so much more data um, in a shorter period of time. So I'm super excited about what AI, AI can bring to the table. But we're working on it. I can't give you an exact date, but we're working on it. Yeah. Thank you so much. I'm going to try to be re as quick as possible since yeah. I know you have to go. And Rihanna is giving me the eye on the other side. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, Mr. Minister, I'm interested in finding out when did you do a, an about face about Galaxy? Because you were very, very clear during your time in opposition uh, about your misgivings about Galaxy and its ability to deliver. Right. But we see that you, you're standing strong behind Galaxy at this moment. Can you explain to us mm -hmm. what has uh, really influenced this change? Now, if somebody did not know, they would say I put you up to that question. Because that's the question I've been waiting for all morning. All morning. So let me explain. Let me tell you. It's not about an about face. And I, and I want you to sit down and reflect on it. This Labour Party has had a very consistent line on some issues. So for example, if DSH... We never said we didn't like DSH. We said we support development in the country, we support the development, but the terms and conditions that were made public, we had an issue with it and we wanted it renegotiated and we gave suggestions as to how the government could approach it. When it came to Carbot, we said we had a problem not with development, but if the NIC was going to buy the lands to do a housing project for St. Lucians, it was wrong to tell them, don't do that. Instead, give a foreign developer the money. And the way they've been allowed and the concessions they've been given, which is not consistent with the law, it should be reviewed. We're not against the development. Our position is, put St. Lucia's interest first. Put our national development agenda first. So when we're in opposition, and the, for, the, the leader of the opposition and the senator who's shadow minister of tourism was going all about boasting about Galaxy and how well they are, how beautiful they are, and that they're the best things for uh, the best company for St. Lucia. We said, look, they're not finishing the hotel in St. Kitts. Are you sure that's the right thing? And we said, look, we have an issue with that. They should be made when they came to start the hotel in St. Lucia. We, we, we highlighted that. Not that we're against Galaxy. But make sure they put the interests of St. Lucia first. That's, that was our essential problem. Then the leader of the opposition says, I heard the talk about them. I investigated them. And they, 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 they fine. There's no problem with them. We said, OK, you investigated. That's fine. Let's move on. When we met with Galaxy, the first thing we said to Galaxy is, look, you've been given shares. You've started um, getting, um, selling shares. When are you starting this hotel? We never said, get out of St. Lucia. Again, consistent with our approach, and I can tell you, we sat down with DSH, with Cabot, with um, Galaxy, we sat down with everybody. GPH, do you know the other opposition had signed, uh, well, basically had an agreement in place with GPH already, yeah? I mean, I, didn't, <laughs> I haven't seen the, the documents where he signed it because a lot of documents cannot be found. But the point is, they were discussing with GPH, all those things. Our approach was as a responsible government. Let us sit with the developer, let's express the problems we've had and how we can correct them. 
So our meeting with, GS, with G, uh, Galaxy was not a hunky-dory. We explained to them, put St. Lucia first, put our interests first. The only building they had on the Galaxy side was temporary accommodation for about 200 Chinese. And we said, no. They said, no, the government has give us permission to bring Chinese workers. We said, no, 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 that cannot happen in St. Lucia under our government. You can bring on specialist workers, you can bring on some workers, but you cannot have Chinese workers. And we said, start the hotel. Start it. We can't take away your shares, we can't take away your, but start it. And they gave us the assurance that they would, as soon as they finished their project in, in St. Kitts, they would come to St. Lucia, move the operations to St. Lucia, and they would start working on the hotel for us. I heard in a clip where they said all the plans have been approved and it's gone through DC already. That was not true. And again, I don't want to go into all those details and expose you know, how the last government ran business. Those things were not true. They, they are still submitting plans now. Galaxy are still submitting plans, designs now, still. So all those were lies. But we said to them, you need to build a hotel for St. Lucia. So it's not an about turn. It's holding them to be accountable. And that's how we're going to do our business. We hold them accountable and to do it the right way and put St. Lucia's interest first. In fact, let me tell you, the last government even sold all the mangrove and you had to get it back to, for the crown because you can't even sell a mangrove. And we've, the Galaxy has even said, based on how um, the development again, the development will even be bigger than what they had agreed to with the last government. But we're going to hold them to account. We'll hold every investor and developer that comes to St. Lucia, they will get the most support. They'll get the most encouragement. Invest St. Lucia is, is very aggressive and supportive and making sure developers get the support. But we will hold them to account and make sure the laws of St. Lucia are followed. So uh, as you just indicated, it's bigger. So the value has gone up. I believe you, in the budget indicated it's something it's over $1 billion mm -hmm. that the mm -hmm. project would be. How many passports, how many? But well, I don't want to give you files because we know that the files can be multiplied by up to yeah, five yeah, or yeah. whatever. How Applications. Many pa yes, how many passports mm. but again, has Galaxy are... sold or have you allocated towards Galaxy? I can tell you from the unit perspective, and I did so in my address, how many um, applications have been approved. And I think I gave those numbers in my address to the nation. You ask me how many they give. I will not here tell you they got A, B, C, or D. I will not. I mean, it, these are private commercial um, information, and I don't think I can on my own just release it. The same way I will not tell you about Cabot. We've not even told you the details about DSH yet. We've not told you about Ojo Labs. And there are a couple of other companies that have never even became public. They only became public to our knowledge when we got into government. But what does it hurt, Minister? Because at the end of the day, Galaxy is the sole, the sole agent in the real estate option, and it's already closed. You know, there were two. And if you go on the website, you'd have seen Aspina Hotel by DSH on the website. But we know that's not happening, and right, so it's right. really Galaxy. Oh, you but, know it's but, not it's already, but it's already closed. Huh? But Galaxy, uh, the Galaxy project, you, yeah. as you indicated, the, fully yeah, subscribed, yeah. so it's closed. Right. So what does it really hurt to let us know? Well, let me ask the Galaxy if they have any issues with their, their commercial information being made public. But we will not on our own. We maintain that. Like I said, we've never come to the public and given all the information on Ojo Labs, on DSH, on Carbot, on, on a couple of others. But the, the citizenship is that of St. Lucia, Minister. Right. Mm -hmm. right. And once they approve, we will release all the names why and must the numbers. They approve? But you have to be approved. No, no. <laughs> why should Galaxy give you the nod to tell us, the citizens, how many passports they no. whenever, have been allocated whenever and sold. Whenever citizenships have been approved, let me repeat it, whenever citizenships have been approved, we will publish it and we'll give the names. We will. And but I, I'm not asking for names right now. I'm just asking about the quantity. And again, I'm saying to you, whenever there are approved applications, we will release the numbers and the names. I will not beforehand release private commercial, commercial information. But once we have approved, that's public knowledge, we will release it. Once any application is approved, there's a process by which we release the numbers, we release the financial returns, and we release the names of the people, and we will do so. Every single time, this government will be transparent and will do so.
I just want to move quickly before uh, you, you whisk away. I thought that's the one I was giving you. I, 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 know, I know, I but I... I we just so good at it. We we have a good connection. So yeah. just if you allow me, one more, two more. Uh, no, not two more. One more, because I have to go. Yeah. Okay, I okay. One more. Uh, with, <laughs> given that you've you've acknowledged that there were, uh, or you, you indicated that you were told that there was an underselling. What was the investigation that you did? What was unearthed? Um, to which agent? Um, were these marketers or promoters representing um, with this underselling, and were passports indeed sold at that price? Okay, let me let me answer you again. The underselling price. Let me let me explain. I want you to listen to me carefully because you're not quoting me right. I did not tell you that I know there was underselling, and I'll come back to that in a point. What I said was, any time just pointed out to us that somebody was advertising discounted sales, we wrote to them. And we wrote to all everybody, reminding them that that's not acceptable. How many times did this happen? A few times, three, four times. But, but the person who said that he heard there was underpricing and he investigated was Alan Chastney. So maybe you should ask him to release to you the re his investigative report. But to whom did you write, sir? Because not, not me. The unit, the unit wrote, wrote to all the promoters. So did the unit trace it back yes, to they which did. agent? And can I tell you the surprising thing about it? Because you really want me to start talking this morning. They did not exist. Who some, did not exist? Those people that were advertising it. Those somebody out there is orchestrating these things. And I can give you, I can give Riani to give you some of the evidence when we ask external forces to f external agencies to find out those people for us they could not find them mm -hmm. this, this thing is very sinister i tell you there are, there are some people that are just desperate for political power and i will give you the evidence i'll give it to Riani. remind me to give you the thing they don't even exist they can't find the address in dubai the, nobody answering the phone number that's there but the advertising discounted prices for st lucia but what we do, we write to all the promoters we work with and said, we have found this. It, this that is not allowed. If you work with that person, you will be banned from working in Central. And they come back to us and say to us, but we do, these people don't even exist. Did you but check so what with I your, your, your petition counterparts to no. see if there, was, if there was a possible link, if there was some... No, I, uh, I will leave that to you and the other journalists, trust me. Maybe the next time you meet the leader of the opposition, ask him to share his investigative report with you. But he said he heard that they were underpricing, and he investigated, and he found there was nothing wrong. So ask him to share the report. I would love to see the report. But can I tell you something? Mm -hmm. If the opposition really pushes it, I will share with you what I found out as to who started, who may have started underpricing in St. Lucia. And I'll tell you, how to, just guess who was the person. But do you have to wait for the opposition for but that? But you see, you see it, it would really undermine, again, a lot of... We don't want to go down that road. But, but if we have to, I will explain to you. How, I, because we, right now we are seeing, for every donation to the last government, how much money went to the National Economic Fund. We can see it, so we know how much we were getting for it. Just listen to the wrong table Dominic Fede did last week, I think, Thursday, 13th. Hey, what he says in there. Now, I'm a person, I, I kind of sometimes, I'm not very smart, but I can listen and pick up some of the sense. He says, not even during COVID when we had sale on solution citizenship, did we go down at as low as 25,000? There's no SI to show 25,000. What does that say to you? Just, just, just reflect on that statement. And he, he just said that. Not even during COVID when we had sales of St. Lucia's citizenship, did we ever go as low as something like that, he said. I can't remember the exact words. What does that mean? What does, maybe he, he, he misspoke. Maybe he didn't mean it to come across the way he did. How but, did it come across to you? That they were aware during COVID, they tried to raise money, so they were encouraging lower sales. Maybe that's, that's how it comes across. But I will never accuse him of that. Never, never, never. I, I would never want to, to believe a minister would say that and mean that. So probably he misspoke. The same way he misspoke and said he was going to release the joint statement the following day, and he never released. But the point is, we will stay focused on following the law. And, and Lisa, trust me, there's a lot we can say. In my address, I try to point out inconsistencies with what the leader of the opposition was saying and what the truth is. 
That's just the tip of the iceberg. That's just the tip of the iceberg. There's a lot we can say. But St. Lucia must come first. St. Lucia. We may have our differences, like I said, but let's, make, let's put St. Lucia first. Don't try to burn down the house to try to kill a, a rat. Yeah, let's not do that. Don't. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.